Hi, everybody. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Welcome to the sit down. Hanging out today with Dave Barry. Dave, brand new book, Lessons from Lucy. Yeah. Congratulations. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. So we were just talking dogs off camera. Yeah. I did not grow up with dogs, but I am going to become a dog guy you, because my You fiance, don't have a dog, but you have a fiance who wants to have a dog. And it's going to happen. Which means you're going to have a dog. <laughs> yeah, you don't get and, a choice in this. You know, I'm reading your book. I'm 60 pages in. Your wife didn't want a dog at first. No. My, my wife thought that dogs are dirty and smelly and lick your face and drink your toilet. And they do. <laughs> They're going to do all those things. But it's, you know, she didn't get why, what was the upside. Right. Uh, as we were saying, it's kind of like kids. Like, you're not Absolutely. sure. Until you have kids, you have no, why would anybody <laughs> want, you know, you look at other people's kids and think, I don't know. But with dogs, it's the same. And so as soon as we got Lucy, my, my daughter, Sophie, mm -hmm. insisted that we, she really wanted a dog and she wore my wife down. And we got Lucy. And now immediately my wife, who up to that point was a fairly hygienic person, mm -hmm you know, get on the floor and let Lucy lick her. And if you've seen the things dogs lick, you know, you, you, it's everything. It's the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> and if that's basically a dog's approach to the world is, I'm going to lick this and maybe even eat it. And if it's not good, I'll just throw it up later. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's, their, that's their methodology. It works pretty well for them. I had a great situation the other day. I was at a Starbucks. It was my fiance, her dad, and there was a dog there and petting the dog. And the dog starts licking this dead rodent that was there. <laughs> and she wait, was, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Back up. <laughs> Why was there a dead rodent? Well, that's a great question. It was like it was like a dead squirrel or something. There. In the Starbucks? No, no, outside of the Starbucks. What are you, like Kentucky? <laughs> <Starbucks>? <laughs> this is in New Jersey. Like, it just happened to be there. It was like a dead squirrel. Yeah. Dog starts licking the dead squirrel. My fiance is in the Starbucks. She comes out, look at the cute dog. And we're like, no, 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 yeah, no, don't do it. Don't, get so away. We, we told her like, after, we're like, by the way, this is what the dog was looking at. She's like, that's okay. You, yeah, know, yeah. you, know, they, you, just, you, you get kinda, used to it. You do, you give up pretty much all of your your uh, sense of hygiene and cleanliness when a dog is coming up to be friendly with you. But actually, they're, I was just about to say they're not that dirty, but really they are. But so never. <laughs> <laughs> well, even your wife trying to put stuff on the sofa. Yeah, yeah. The sofa. There's an ongoing battle, and and this happens every dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, know, you have to make a decision when you bring a dog into your home. What is the dog allowed to do and not allowed to do? Right. And there are people I've heard who are capable of training a dog to not get on the sofa. Mm -hmm. I've never been able to do that, you know? I'm always like, the dog wants to be on the sofa more than I care yeah, about the sofa. Totally, and you're just gonna deal with it. You're gonna, you know? eventually. If, if so the dog sheds, you're gonna deal you're with gonna, it. Yeah, I even went and I bought an electronic thing that you're supposed to put on, and it, they, they say it's a hydrostatic charge. It mm. shocks the dog, yeah, but yeah. I don't wanna say that, right, I guess. Right. But, um, and even that, my, my dog is kind of a nuclear physicist. You know, it's bright in other ways, but in, when it, she's Albert Einstein when it comes to figuring out how to get on furniture she's mm. not supposed to be on. That's really interesting. And I feel like dogs pick up on what humans are feeling, too. And you kind of get into this in the book. It's like dogs may not talk necessarily, but Lucy does talk in certain ways. So how did you realize that when you first had her home? Well, the way you realize your dog can talk is... Um, and it's not barking. Barking is reserved mm -hmm. for like emergencies, like I need to go out right. or there's a garbage man there. Um, you know, something really mm -hmm. important. But talking is like it, when they have a, an actual thing to communicate to you. And in, in, in the case of Lucy, at approximately 7.03 every morning, when, when the sun is up, Lu Lucy comes into the bedroom. <laughs> It says right next to me, so she's this far away. I'm sound asleep at this point. Mm. Right there is this dog, big black nose, right there, and she goes, Arr! <laughs> <laughs> which is not words per se, but right. it means get up now. Yeah. It's the sun is up. It's time. I'm to ready to be Let's walked. go. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> there could be a garbage man out there. Yeah. We could be barking. Absolutely. Yeah. So why did you want to write the book? How did it all come about? Well, I turned 70 uh, last year, which is old. You don't look 70. Well, I, was, I am, I was, I was honestly genuinely surprised when I looked at the cover, and I was like, really? 70? Yeah, well, that's because I, I is have Is that a, Florida Sun? What is it? No, it's a, I have a Beatles haircut from 1964. <laughs> 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 that's, my, that's my secret. Um, the... the um, Anyway, okay, so I turned 70 right. last year, and Lucy turned 10, mm -hmm. which, so dog years, she's now 70. Yes. Uh, and, and I thought, I don't really like being old. I really don't. There's a lot of things about it that just suck. Mm. And, and I'm, you know, talking about, you know, I don't, I don't have as many friends. I don't have as much fun. I don't just do as much stuff. And Lucy has not changed at all. I mean, she sleeps a little more and everything, but she still has as much fun as she ever does. She does the same things. She's just as excited about going mm -hmm. out and, you know, wh whatever is going on, she's just as into it and as excited as she always totally. was. Whereas yeah. I've kind of lost that <laughs> fire 
along the way. What a lazy ears you get in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, just like cranky old, like, you have a choice between going out and not going out. Yeah, like it's, saying, it's a lot easier to not yeah, go out. Totally. And I live in Miami where, you know, going out is it's nice usually, mm -hmm. but still. So that was the beginning of it, you know, and I, I thought, well, what, what, what is Lucy doing that I'm not doing, that I could do that would make me happier? And so the, the book is basically my effort to see what she does do those things except for drinking from the toilet. Yeah, that's probably a good one not to do. Not to do, and that's another reason you're going to love having a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I can't you, wait. When you're just lying, I mean, you're lying there, kind of maybe you're enjoying a cold beer, yep. I don't know, and you hear from the far end of the yeah, house, like, oh, you hear slurp, because they can really make a lot of it, because yeah. the bowl gives them that you know echo. Totally. And uh, yeah, so you'll see. <laughs> oh, you'll see. Well, I like how you use Lucy to kind of have a, this gut check moment for yourself because you're 70 and you're like, you know what, I could do this better, I could talk to my friends more, and you also are really vulnerable just about things that you've gone through in your life. So how difficult was that for you to just let it all out there? It was more than, yeah, I don't usually write uh, introspective mm -hmm. books, I usually write booger jokes, yeah. you know, and um, that's as far as I get in to myself, <laughs> my nasal path. Uh, but yeah, I, it, to, to write a book about you know, what I don't like about myself mm -hmm. and what I can do better, I had to talk about myself yeah. more than I usually do. And so, I mean, it's not exactly a self-help book, but it's more of a self-help book than any other book I've written. Most of my books actually hurt people. Mm. You know, people read them and they come out of them stupider right. than they went in. This one, I, I, I actually try to impart some knowledge and yeah, it, it required me to, to think a, a little bit more about who I am and what I like really and what I want out of my life, what's left of it. Yeah, no, I think that's cool. So when did writing become a thing for you? When did you realize you can make a career out of this? Well, I, I was an English major, mm -hmm. so I graduated with absolutely no useful skills. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really wanted to write, so I, I got a job at a newspaper. Um, and it, you know, it was, it was called the Daily Local News in Westchester, Pennsylvania. And I covered, which is, it sounds like the newspaper Superman with the, yeah. the daily local news <laughs> when he was a boy. Um, and I, you know, I did everything you do as a, as a new reporter. I covered the municipal meetings that are probably mm. still going on, yep. you know. Well, that's and, how you got to get it going. Yeah, you know? yeah. Fires and obituaries and all that stuff. And, and I, I loved it. I mean, I loved it. I always still love it. I, I love to write. That was not so much creative writing, at least it wasn't supposed to be. But I gradually from there got into writing columns where I could just make everything up which is a much easier. You kids who want to get into journalism, get into the part where you're just making everything up. It's, yeah, they don't really pitch that in you school. Know, not, you know? don't have to go out and <laughs> you know, talk to humans. You can just you know, sit around in your underwear. You can actually do it in anybody's underwear. That's a <laughs> little, little, little in, professional tip. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't yeah. matter whose underwear no, it is. No. <laughs> so how do you make the pivot from hard journalism to being in this fantasy world? It kind of was, it, well, I took a weird route, but basically I left journalism for a while and I was teaching effective writing seminars. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I was going into you know, businesses and talking to chemists and accountants. Oh, wow. Yeah, and yeah. Talk, talking about like how they should not start their letters with enclosed, please find the enclosed enclosure, and try to write you right. know, more clearly, more directly. And while I was doing that, I had a lot of time. I was in traveling, and I was in hotels and airports. So I started writing a humor column. Mm. And did, it was not really, I didn't think, going to be my career. I'd already done the journalism right. thing, and I was doing But then some newspapers started running my column, and it, and it got more and more popular. And then eventually I realized, I mean, I got offered jobs. I could stop, you know, doing the last productive thing I was doing was teaching <laughs> and, and never have to be productive again. Just right. write stuff be, and make, you know, people laugh. So that's, it was a really great job. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So who are some of your favorite writers from over the years? Well, I, the, you'll never, you will never have heard of the guy who was my absolute favorite writer, but it was a guy named Robert Benchley, who was okay. really popular back in the 20s, 30s, and he was, he was what I did. Mm. He, well, he was a brilliant humor, and I mean, I'm saying, not, that sounds like I'm saying I'm No, brilliant. you're a brilliant not saying I'm writer, brilliant. come on. No, but he was, and, and he was really, really funny, and when I was a kid, I idolized him. I, I was the only kid who read Robert Benchley, and mm. I, so he was the one I really wanted to be. Then I was growing up, like, there was Art Buckwald and Irma Bombeck, and a lot of, there were a lot of humor columnists in newspapers, Newspapers are things that we, we used to have. <laughs> Missed those things, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and, um, and you know, so I like I read them, and I thought that would be so cool. I never thought I could be that. You know, I wasn't like one of those ambitious. I'm going to be mm -hmm. Art Buckwald someday. Um, it it kind of fell upon me. Right. So that was nice. I didn't have to fail. To I mean, I didn't have to worry about failure because I never really aspired to it. Yeah, it's amazing how your life can just kind of shift without any idea that it'll happen this way. Yeah, you know? I, I kind of believe in that. I mean, I, I meet people, uh, you know, younger people who want to be writers mm -hmm. and want to do, 
and a lot of them want to have a plan, and they want, and I, I'm, I'm this is probably corny, and everybody's I said, but I would say just kind of write what you want to write, do what you want to do, make sure you have a real job, right? Because people will not pay you to write at the beginning yeah. ever. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you're good at it and people like it, eventually it will happen. You can't sort of force it. Um, but I advocate being like it took me till I was in my mid 30s mm. before I was really an established, successful humor writer. It's a slow burn, and people coming out of school don't they understand They want to like, yeah. They, they want, want it right away. These kids today, <laughs> with their rap music, want it <laughs> in there. Whatever they have today, I don't even know. But I'm sure for you, like, you never could have imagined starting this writing, and then your writing turning into movies, TV shows. Like, that must blow your mind when you think about it now. Yeah, it's been a ridiculous, I mean, I've had just a wonderful career, and, and, it's, and it is, um, it, as you say, a lot of things have happened to me that, I really would have never predicted and never expected. Um, but it's kind of nicer when you're not trying too hard to have them happen to you. Right. Then when they do that, it feels like gifts and it feels great. And, Absolutely. But, but then you don't worry like, I didn't do enough, because you're like, this is great. I didn't expect this much, you right. know? And it's not like you're covering war scenes, you know? You're, you're writing humor. Right, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing anything important. <laughs> let's never, let's not suggest that for a second. Like sometimes people will say, um, you know, Dave, I mean, I've, this is generally touching when they say mm -hmm. it. They say, you know, I, your writing, your humor has really helped me. I've gone through, some, well, I was going through a tough time. It really helped me to read it. Thank you so much for doing what you do. And what I don't say to them is, I would, this is all I know how to do. So even <laughs> if it was bad for people, I, <laughs> I would still I would do still, it. <laughs> I'm really glad if laughter is helpful, because sure. that's what they say. But even if a lot, laughter were harmful, I don't know what else to yeah, do, you know? This is your thing. It's kind of like, yeah. So when you won the Pulitzer, that must have been an amazing moment for you. It was, okay, I'll tell you my, my Pulitzer story. I didn't, first of all, this is not false modesty. I did not expect to win a Pulitzer mm -hmm. Prize. I really was writing booger jokes mm -hmm. in the newspaper. And you know, I was happy, yeah. it was fun. But I got nominated without knowing it, and then I won without knowing it. And, oh, wow. Well, they didn't tell me. The newspaper, the Miami Herald knew, but they didn't tell me. They wanted me to find out in a big surprise when, mm -hmm. when it was announced. So they tricked me into coming into the Herald that day. And I, I was supposed to go to Key West that day oh, with, wow. with my son, Rob, who was seven years old, mm -hmm. who loved to go to Key West because we always rented a motorbike. Mm -hmm. And he thought that was so much fun. So like, we're going to Key West, we're going to Key West. And suddenly I get this call from my editor at the Herald, you have to come to the Herald. Like, I, I can't, I'm going to Key West. No, you, you have to come in. Like, no, come on. The editors are insisting that you come in for this meeting. Okay, so I go in and there's everybody's gathered in the newsroom and nobody's told me why. So I'm thinking my meeting's come up. So I'm standing there with Rob, yeah. my son, and he, you know, we're looking around. And then just before the announcement gets made, one of the editors who didn't know it was supposed to be a surprise came up to me and said, congratulations. Oh, man. And I think, oh my <laughs> God, I'm about to win a Pulitzer Prize. But then I realized but that means we can't go to Key West <laughs> because they, you know, now I have to do all this stuff. Right. So I, I lean down to Rob and I say, Rob, we're not gonna go to Key West this weekend. And his face falls and I go, mm. but, I will buy you a Nintendo. Because he really wanted a Nintendo. Nice and I was being a good dad and saying, not till your birthday, you know. Mm. So he goes, really? I go, yeah. And he jumps up and puts his arms around mm. me with this huge smile. And at that moment, they announced that I won the Pulitzer Prize and they took my picture. Oh. So on the front page of the Miami Herald the next day is this picture saying, you know, Pulitzer Prize and a picture of me and my, my son with a big smile. And everybody said, it was so great that your son was so excited that you won the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Most and they, other kids, he had no yeah. idea. <laughs> he was thinking of the Nintendo. Oh, it was all about the Nintendo. That's an all-timer right there in terms of the story and the picture. You'll have that forever. I have that picture. And it shows Rob with his big smile. That was his big moment. That's awesome. So when people check out the book, there, there's a lot to take in. But what yeah. do you want them to think about themselves? And what should they think about dogs in general as well? Well, I think, mean, first of all, this is just, I'll make this pitch. You should get, if, you, if you're interested in getting a dog, you should get a dog, and you should get a rescue dog. That's what we did. Mm -hmm. There's a million of them out there. They're all wonderful. And it, it will help, you know, it will change their life, but will also change your life. But also, like, I'm not kidding. If you watch your dog, and just do what your dog, certain things your dog, like paying attention to the people you're with, um, you know, just being around, the, caring about the people you want to be you're with, you know, being in the moment with them. You'll, you'll be a better person just, just for having the dog. Also, you'll have to go out and walk the dog, so that'll be good for you physically. Yeah, no doubt about it. And also, your toilet will be regularly drunk if you um, need that. I'm ready for it all. Yeah. Dave, thank you so much. Thank you. My it's been pleasure. A pleasure. Lessons from Lucy. You guys can buy it wherever books are sold. We'll see you next time here on Sit Down.